way, ways we can make the art guilds to be better for y'all. Uh, and one of the, the first things is that uh, is the board member uh, members, we're working very closely with Seth Hopkins over at the museum to make the art guild to be as good as the art museum is itself. And I don't know if y'all saw on the Facebook, the, the 20 year celebration of the museum and some of the statistics of that, in 20 years, they've had 880,000 visits. They, that is the largest Western art museum in the world, square footage wise. Um, it is a, a, an affiliated with the Smithsonian Institute. It's an amazing thing. And out of that amazing museum, we have an amazing art guild that, where we can have classes and learn, where we can have in our meetings, we can have demonstrations. Uh, tonight, we have Nikki Davidson, if you don't know who she is. She's an amazing instructor. Um, I have a nice long bio here, but I'm just going to tell you, and I told her I would say this, I just remember the Beach Boy song, California Girl. She's from Newport Beach, California, and, and my mind just goes to those surfing days back when I was a teenager. And you too. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to your bio a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, the other thing that we are doing from the board meeting is we've updated the Facebook page. If you're not a member of Facebook, or the Facebook page, please look at it. Uh, we're also building a, a new web page, just specifically for the Art Guild. And it's just about to be launched um, very quickly. It should be sometime this week. Okay. Uh, and in that web page, we're hoping to have a way of having all the members of the Guild on there uh, and some contact information. So that uh, we are a full guild and it's our, it's our webpage. Uh, another thing, of course, we're doing, we have the upcoming West Fest, that's in October, October 28th. We're hoping to have, it's a planning at this point, to have a plein air quick paint competition the morning of the West Fest. Has anybody here ever participated in a quick paint? It's fun. It's demanding, it's, it's talent on demand. You get about two hours to paint something, hopefully somewhere around there, some of the characters we have or the museum grounds or whatever uh, to paint it. Uh, the hopes um, that we'll have enough people to participate to make it a grand opportunity. It's gonna be open to the public, all members of the Art Guild, it's free. If you're not a member of the Art Guild, it's a $25 charge. And the winning painting, it will be judged. We will have a judge come in and judge it. The winning painting will get a $250 uh, prize. So it, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Another thing that we're doing is at Seth's direction, we're being given a lot of control on the future of the downtown gallery. To try to find ways to make it better, more friendly, more productive. One of the things that pops in our head is we have three shows a year there. The, I, I feel that the art gets a little stale if it's on the wall that long. We're looking at maybe increasing the number of shows even up to six a year so that we have a, a faster turn of, of painting, of art, because I know we, are, we don't just do one or two paintings a year. Uh, it's an opportunity to get fresher paintings out there, get some more interest in and perhaps maybe sell some more paintings. So that, that's, a, that's a really exciting thing coming up. And the last thing in particular is that starting next year, we're gonna move from the Art Academy over to the Bergman Theater and the museum. We'll be moving from Tuesday nights to Thursday nights because the museum's open uh, until late on Thursdays. We'll have the theater to use. And in the theater, we'll have some professional Zoom camera equipment so that we can open up the meetings to those who can come. We have about 200 and what is it, Mike? 280? 263, I think. 263 members of the Art Guild. And not all of them live locally. And even those who live in Atlanta, I cannot imagine trying to go from Atlanta up to Cartersville on, on, on a Friday or Tuesday afternoon and try to get here on time with the, the traffic. So having the Zoom capability, if for some reason you have to stay home or you're too far away, we will be opening the meetings to even a greater group of our uh, members. So that, that's an absolutely wonderful list of things that we're trying to do to make this more interactive and, and to support y'all in your art. It's very important to, to find a way to help promote ourselves through education and through uh, marketing 
and uh, the, the ways just to improve it. Uh, we have a, a list of, of uh, upcoming events that will be listed on the Facebook page, if not already. We have John Guernsey coming uh, in September, Lillian Ansley in October. Lillian's going to talk to us about the art of marketing ourselves as artists. Uh, Dr. Andrew Sheldon, and then the holiday party in December will have Susan Patton doing an animal portrait demo. So these are some really interesting things coming up. Um, but for tonight, I think we have probably one of the most interesting, and, and that's Nikki Davis. And I, I'm a little biased because she, I go to her classes and she beats me up every Thursday night. Some about soft edges. It's, it's like these clouds here, see these hard edges here? These need to be softer edges. Okay. <laughs> but Nikki is an absolutely wonderful artist and an instructor. Uh, she has been painting for over 50 years. She is from Newport Beach, California, does wonderful seascapes. She moved here. Uh, it's a long way from Newport, but uh, has her studio in Dallas, Georgia. And um, uh, she has art hanging quite a few places. She sold a painting that I wanted at the uh, Oil Painters of America in Charleston just recently, uh, some beautiful chickens. Uh, but uh, her, her artwork is absolutely ma uh, marvelous and she has a way of helping us to open our minds and our eyes to some different aspects. And I'm hoping tonight we will see some, we'll put our heads in the clouds tonight. So Nikki, it's all yours. Hello. This is a microphone for you. Oh, God. Uh, I know you can flip it on or. <laughs> All right. And we are you going to talk about your workshop coming oh. up? Yes. Okay. Or, we we you only can. have a couple of slots left. So if you're looking to get into the people's job, we're ready. Thanks, <laughs> Kathy. As soon as Yes. Can all y'all hear me? Yes. Back there, too? Right. I never had a problem with that. <laughs> So at any rate, tonight we're going to talk about the big sky. It's not just clouds, it's the big sky. You know, the right sky, the right tone, the right mood can make or break a painting. And so I think what I've, I've done here is I've given you sort of a, a, a look at different moods, uh, different ideas for the big sky. And then I'm going to do a, a short demo here to show you the structure of clouds and then hopefully if there's time i'll go ahead and start a painting so are there any questions before i get started okay um i do want you to notice this here this is a pastel and in my workshop i'm going to be teaching oils as well as pastels if you if you feel like it and you want pastel instead of the oil you're welcome to do that. They're very similar. Um, okay, so this is a painting that was done recently, last May, when I went to Charleston. We painted, but a group of us I went and rented a house for the Oil Painters of America uh, convention there and a competition. And so this is on Foley Beach, and we all painted and photographed until we were blue in the face, had a wonderful time. Great place to go for art. Their gallery scene is fabulous. This painting was done from photographs from my front yard. So this is from my front yard. This is from my little pea brain here. Just make it up. Cause I think that, you know, when you're taking photographs outside, you're gonna have telephone wires, and you're gonna have stop signs, you have the CVS right there. You might get some sky, but you're gonna get all of this other junk. Well, just get rid of it. Just you know, find another piece, a landscape, a seascape, uh, anything that will finish off the bottom of your, of your painting. And then this little one's from the backyard, very moody. You see the difference between these two, very happy, sunny, very moody moonset on this. And then this is also from the Charleston trip. Beautiful sunsets there. Holy cow, it's, it's gorgeous. And that's just made up. That's 
well, I don't have the photo, but at any rate, it's pastel um, on sanded paper. And it's actually quite fun to, to use it. It's not as messy. It's not near as toxic as oil. So if you have an issue with oils, this is a good direction to go. Now, I wanted to bring this painting. It's, it is one I'm still working on, but what I wanted to show you is that the original painting, this photograph here, can everybody see this photo? I'll just hold it up. So this is a friend of mine and she is a powwow dancer and she had this marvelous shawl. She does shawl dance, fancy shawl dancing. And I couldn't wait to paint it. But the problem was I didn't have any background. So like, you know, the clouds that are beautiful over CVS, I had to kind of work out what it was I wanted to do with her. So that's where it was. And this is where it's at now. And it's still not finished. But you can see that the clouds, let's see if I can set it up here. The clouds actually help give some depth to this young lady. And I still have, the trick with this is to get a little bit more detail in the clouds, but not so much that it takes away from the subject, the main subject. It's not about the cloud, the clouds supporting the portrait. And then I need to work some more in here to give it a better foreground, et cetera. But um, once I did this, I went back and I looked at every portrait, every figurative piece I've ever painted. Well, that wasn't finished. And uh, I'm thinking about, you know, what am I gonna do with that background? To me, this was fun and interesting and exciting. Um, so it gave me a lo lots of ideas. Okay, so I'm gonna start off by just doing some structure, some simple structure on clouds here. Uh, I use different surfaces. This is just a inexpensive wrapped canvas, cotton canvas. I work on, uh, I work on boards, I work on linen. I like texture, I like smooth uh, surfaces to paint on. So I'm, I'm pretty easy going on that. And if you have any questions, please just holler out. Okay, so what do we know about clouds? Good one, okay. So one of the colors you probably don't wanna use by itself out of the tube is titanium white. White out of the tube is cold. And so clouds, you know, if you're doing a snow scene, you might use more titanium white than another white, like warm white, for instance because you want that feeling of cold, but straight, it's boring and it's flat. So what you can do is you can add a little bit of warmth to your titanium white, put in a little bit of yellow ochre, or you can, if you have the money, you can buy a tube of warm white, which is already mixed for you. I like Michael Harding's uh, warm white. I use that a lot, quite a bit, a lot. And if you can see the difference here, hopefully from the background there, is this high enough for everybody to see? Yeah, okay. And here it's more, this is white, titanium white with a little bit of lemon yellow in it. So it's cooler. So this is cooler and this is a little bit warmer and that gives a little bit of uh, depth to this cloud. Now, the other thing you wanna know about clouds, what? That was what not to do, don't use white. Well, we don't have, you can't do that anymore. That's no longer a rule. You can do anything that you want. Some people are so good at it that they make it work. Uh, but what we do have are guidelines. And so this is a guideline. Stay away from titanium white. And when you're painting clouds, you wanna think about volume. So that cloud is not flat. It's got sides, it's got depth. So in order to create volume, you've got to change values. If I just painted this cloud one 
color in here with one value, it would look flat like a painted wall. So what we're looking for is to get a little bit more value change in there and sometimes temperature change uh, to give this thing a little bit more dimension. So I'm going to work on this cloud as if I was just experimenting with it. And I want to see, you know, what can I do to make this thing look more three-dimensional, have more volume. So <clears throat> there are a maximum number of value changes you can have in an object. The more value changes, the more dimensional it will look. But you need a minimum of, gosh, you're going to be in trouble. Three. <laughs> yes, right. You've got to have light, medium, and dark. If you don't have those three, it's going to look flat. So look at things that you painted before, and if you don't have a good value cha uh, change in there, um, it is going to look flat. Take this for example. Here's the lightest value. Here's your middle, middle, and there's your dark value. And that's why they look so three-dimensional. The same here. I've got, this is pretty dark. That's pretty light. Here we've got a middle value. Probably could have changed, you know, made that a little bit lighter. The painting overall, it's mostly dark, some medium, and a little bit of light. Here's your light. Medium, medium, and light. Three dimensions, minimum of three value changes. It's going to make something look much more three-dimensional. So I'm going to build from my darker values first. That works for me. Some people like to do middles first, some, some like to do light, but for me, it's definitely darks first. And I think that with clouds in particular, if you paint thin to begin with, and then build the paint, it works better. You start off with a glob of paint on there, and then you have to change that value. Ooh, it can be a mess. So save those chunky pieces until the very end when you want to really put emphasis in an area. So starting with the dark, oh, and I am, I'm working on a toned canvas. I prefer actually doing my own um, underpainting. So that's my reference. That's probably helpful. So the third thing I want to tell you about clouds and, and value is that cameras lie. <laughs> so <laughs> so anyway, um, that was funny, and I've lost my train of thought here. <laughs> the, well, well, we'll back up. The, I'm sorry? Cameras lie. Yes, cameras lie. And one of the issues with cameras is that the darks, when you, when you photograph them, the darks are darker than you would see with your naked eye. The lights are brighter than you would see with your naked eye. And Gary, you do a lot of plain air painting. You probably very familiar with that. And you as a photographer, you yeah, have, you have yeah. Right. yeah. I encourage people to go paint plain air for that reason. Yes, exactly. It looks so much different with your eyes on the subject instead of on a one dimensional piece. So looking at my photograph here, you can see that the darks under this cloud, this is a sunny day. And so the darks under this cloud give us the impression that it's stormy, a stormy cloud. So if you want to keep that sunny, happy cloud, you know, sunny day look, you're going to um, lighten these values. All right. So I'm at this point slightly lighter than what's on there. This method that I'm using to apply the paint 
is called scumbling. Can you see, Martha? Do you have a particular um, intention with the yellow chrome, or do you have an orange or green? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I look at the reference or sky, and you know, if we were outside, and I try to see what colors do I see through that cloud. So there's two ways to think about this. If it's a real cool cloud, lots of blues and grays in it, I would probably underpaint with a warm burnt sienna, maybe even a little bit of blue and orange together and do a thin coat of that. Uh, so there's two ways to think about it. You can do the opposite uh, as far as temperature goes. So if it's a warm cloud, do a cool underpainting, or you can go with complementary colors. So if it's a blue cloud, you could do a, a light orange, um, red and green. So those work, those do work. In this case, I wanted it a little bit sunny and I'm painting very thin. So when you paint thin, uh, that background is gonna show through. And so I wanted it pretty sunny in this case. For my medium, I use um, you know, right brain, left brain, you can't paint and talk at the same time. <laughs> I use uh, gam solvent-free gel, and I mix it into the paint piles before I actually mix the color I'm going to be painting with. And it gives it a little buttery uh, kind of feel to it. I don't use turpentine as a rule or gamsol to thin my paint because it actually corrupts the paint. It makes your brush strokes less. And really, I'm not exactly painting at this point. My philosophy is, if you hear that scrubbing sound on your canvas, you're not painting, you're drawing, you're scribbling, which is okay. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I haven't added any paint strokes and I do want you to know the difference. And I'll do that in a little bit when I get to uh, come down to blend these colors. Uh, a lot of people want to know what paints I use. And um, I use a variety of paints. There's a lot of cloud color that's purple, sort of a purpley gray. You'll see that in a lot of clouds. So one of the paints that I use is by Sennelier, and it's called Neutral Tint. And it's a perfectly grayed down purple, beautiful color. Great for portraiture too. So to get this gray purple, that's what I've mixed with my gray. I prefer to make my gray rather than get it from the tube. So first in order to do that, I have to make black. And I make my black with burnt sienna and ultramarine, ultramarine blue. And that makes a real nice black. And then, And then <laughs> she can't talk in pain at the same time, never could. And then once you have your black made, then you can add white to it to make it gray. Now, what if you want a cool black? You're using ultramarine blue, you know, so don't say. Ultramarine blue and burnt sienna make black but I wanted a cool black, what would you add? A little, okay, light, white will lighten, but ultramarine blue is gonna cool it off. What if it's too cool? Obviously, burnt sienna, you add a little bit more burnt sienna to it.
I'm sure a lot of you know this, but color temperature, whether a color is warm or whether it's cool, has a, an important function in composition. Warm colors tend, in, in a traditional setting, landscape, still life, portrait, um, warm colors come forward, cool colors recede. So if, for instance, you're painting a sky with lots of clouds in it, and you want the clouds to recede so that you have the feeling of a, a depth of field there, put the cooler, lighter colors, smaller shapes in the back and the larger shapes and the lighter values and darker values in the clouds in the front. I have an example of that here. Uh, here's another thing you might not wanna do with clouds. This is a photograph, so we're gonna believe it's true, but if you painted this, no one would believe it. So these clouds look like they're on a string stacked one on top of the other right? But you're not going to stand next to the painting with a photograph as people come by and look and say, well, the photograph was just like that, right? You're, you're going to want to make it better. That's our job as artists. So here's an example of how to do that. Notice how the shapes change. The larger clouds are in the front, medium, <laughs> medium size, Oh, bless her heart. Mm -hmm. So the medium-sized clouds are in the middle and the smaller clouds are in the back, all right? And that's what gives that depth of field in a sky. And here's another example. So these are warmer clouds, again, stacked one on top of another. And then this is the way to paint it to make it look like it has much more depth. So the bigger clouds in the front, medium sized clouds in the middle, and the smaller ones in the back. Okay, so for right now at this juncture, I think I've got enough dark on there. It's, I have a few spots. I haven't blended anything yet because I want to see those colors and I want to see how they play with each other. I want to see the temperature and how they work with each other. And there are so many ways to blend. My philosophy is that you paint the thing that's furthest away first. That would be the sky because the clouds overlap the sky. And the same with anything in a landscape, the same uh, philosophy for a still life or a portrait. The furthest thing away, you paint that first. Then you paint the thing that overlaps it and then the thing that overlaps it and then the thing that overlaps it until you're in the front. And yes, I, I haven't put the sky in here because I will, I'm going to be putting a little bit of sky in here so that you can see how to blend edges. But I just thought, you know, the color is so overwhelming. I want you to see what's going on here first. All right, so I'm gonna put this, here's, here's another interesting thing about paint mixing. Now, when I look at my white palette and I look at the warm white that I'm using, that warm white really looks yellow. But as soon as you pick that up and you put it next to a different reference, it's gonna change its value, might even change its temperature. So mixing to match your photograph, it's a good thing. Let me get my palette knife out here. And this is the way I do it. I'll mix the paint first. On the bottom of my palette knife, I'll hold the palette knife up to the reference to see, have I matched the value? Have I matched the color? You can see from where you're at, I think that this is what, it's too light, it's too light. So I would need to take that pile that I've just mixed into and I would need to darken that slightly. I'm 
I'm adding Naples yellow. So I'm closer in color, I'm closer in value. A little strong. It's pretty intense, this color, isn't it? Does anybody know how to take the intensity of a color down? Yes. You use a complement. So if this is basically yellow, and I want to take down the intensity, I'm going to use a lavender or a violet, which I have mixed here. And you use a little, just sneak up on it. You can always add more, but boy, once you've added too much, okay, so I don't know if you can see that, but it has toned quite a bit. That's not the finale, that's not the final. Because once you get that on there, then <laughs> you've got to put it on your canvas. So I take my mixed color and I'll take that palette knife over to the painting and I'll see how close am I. And here's another interesting thing. And I, I keep trying to tell my students this, it's okay to put a dot on there, to actually touch the canvas to see if, You've matched your value, your color, your temperature. Touch the canvas. Because the reference color and value that you have here is not the same as the reference and color and value that you have on your mixing palette. That's why so many artists use a gray palette. I've never figured that out in 55 years. I've never figured out a gray palette, so I'm not good at that. But this works for me. I'll mix my color, put a little bit on the canvas to see do I need to adjust that. And yes, I would need to adjust that. The other thing is you can mix the perfect mix and it matches your photo. You put it on there, it matches that, and then you brush it on and it no longer matches. The problem is you're putting the paint on too thin. When you mix that pile of paint, it was a thick, opaque pile of paint and it looks completely different. Thick, and it does thin because oil paint is translucent. So you, you can see through it slightly. So if you paint thin, what's gonna come through there? Whatever, yeah, the underpainting, whatever is underneath it. So just keep that in mind that, you know, if you're going to be matching this, you may have to go darker than you think. or lighter, you know, it depends. All right, so I'm gonna to try to prove this point to you here. And let's see. So I put this paint on pretty thick. Both of these are pretty thick. I'm gonna take that off. And I'm gonna pick up that new color and value. If I put it on thick, you can see how bright it is or how yellow it is. It's just not that bright, but it's yellow. But if I take that paint and I'm using the side of my brush, I scumble this in. Scumbling is just another word for scribbling with paint. So what's happening is that that color's thin and that color's coming through. Now you may want that. And in this case I do, because in the beginning when I paint a cloud or a sky, paint thin. Once I have my colors, my values, my temperature, then I'll go back, remix my paint and add the colors in a, in a painterly way, because I like brush strokes. But this is just kind of a fun way to find your way around. So something else about clouds. Their shapes, oh my gosh, there are a thousand shapes. On the same cloud, you're gonna have a million shapes in there, at least a million. And 
to make it more realistic and more three-dimensional, you have to figure out where's the light source. The light source coming strictly from the top, does it come from the left or the right? And that's where you put your highlight. So your strongest area on a cloud is where the light source is. In this reference here, it's above. And you can see that because of the, the low tones that are in the bottom. Oh, I don't know if you can see that. I should put that up there, shouldn't I? Not everybody's my height. I hear the giggles. It's okay. I'm getting used to it. Because I'm sure not getting taller. <laughs> <clears throat> So then if my light source is coming from up above, that means that the top of my cloud is going to have to be lighter there. So I'm going to put my lighter values up at the top. I'm still scumbling at this point and leaving some of the darks. So I haven't added darks in here. You, you saw it just, it came just like this. But if I wanted those darks to show through, the trick is just scumble a little bit harder. Don't put so much paint on and your underpainting will come through. And then there are those of us who like to put in tons and tons of paint on things. And that's okay too. It's just a different way of looking at it. As I go down here to the bottom of this cloud, I want my values to get slowly darker. And also slowly warmer. So this is probably the last, I think, lesson uh, for painting clouds. So clouds get warmer at the bottom because they're reflecting what's on the earth. They get cooler as it gets to the top because it's reflecting what's in the atmosphere, what's higher, what's above it. Your um, photo up there, your, the size and shape of your photo is slightly different than the size and shape of your canvas. Yes. Have you extended the clouds or are you talking about them? What did you decide for your composition there? So notice that I have so much more length here. And plus, I wanted everybody to be able to see it. So I, I just focused in on the two larger clouds, not putting everything in there. But in my um, in my studio, I have already painted this, I should have brought it with me. And it's got landscape and it's got that one tree that sort of balances that big cloud up there. Now I'm using a filbert for a reason. This is a fluffy cloud and filberts are round. <clears throat> and so they make that shape quite nicely. So I'm, you, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not scrubbing anymore. I'm actually laying the paint on. I'm making brush strokes. No matter what you're painting, but in particular clouds, watch out for repetitive shapes. Repetitive shapes are very boring. And the viewer is going to get tired of looking at the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. So that's one of my favorite phrases for class. Same, 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 same thing. Right? <laughs> so, so watch out for that. That's a biggie, especially when you're when you wing it. And I'm kind of winging it a little bit. I mean, why not? It's my painting. <laughs> that sounds a little petulant, didn't it? That's mine. I do whatever I want.
Now, frankly, if I wasn't talking and standing up here, this painting would be done now because I paint very quickly. But I thought it would be beneficial to show you a few um, extended brush strokes here so that you know you might be able to play with. with your brush in the same way when you get to working on clouds. So I'm trying to get, I'm trying to work this so that I'm getting warmer and warmer as I go down to the bottom of the cloud. Yes. Good question. So warm and cool is relative. So if I have um, a bright red next to alizarin crimson, you're familiar with that color, I think. Yeah. Which is a real bluey kind of red. Which one of those two is warmer? Yes, the cadmium red, light, or orange. They're both warm. So it's relative. So if I'm, and that's really such a good question. So look at this painting over here, for instance. We've got two clouds in shadow here. This one's green and this one's blue. Which one's warmer, which one's cooler? It is, and, and say, say again, it has yellow in it, the sun color in it, so it's warmer. Now, what if I made this over here more of a rose or a purpley color next to the green? Which one would be warmer? Yeah, it would be the purple. Purple has the red in it, and this doesn't have that much yellow in it, a little bit. So what I'm trying to point out is it's relative. This is purple. Purple has red in it. But is it cool next to this? Mm -hmm. It is. It is exactly. So and what do you do with, the, with, with that temperature change? Well, again, there's two things, except for sunsets. Sunsets have all their own little rules. <laughs> but in any other classical situation, cool recedes, and warm comes forward. And you can use that to um, enhance your composition. Putting the warmer colors in the front, cooler colors in the back, lighter in the back, less detail, is gonna make it a lot more interesting than if you have it the other way. However, I have seen many paintings, depends on the light source and what you're painting, where it is cooler in the front and warmer in the back. Ta-da. Right? Okay, so hot in the back, cool in the front. But that's sunset. You know, sunsets are crazy. They just can do anything you want with sunset. Okay, I need to get some middle values in here. So here are my middle values here. Darkest values in here and the lightest are in here. Now I'm going to just put some yellow ochre on there. How's that? So a couple of things about that. It's yellow, it's warmer, it comes forward. And that area is the shadow and it recedes. So what should I do? What could I do to make that recede? Think about what's cooler. You can say, thank you. So I'm going to add a little bit of blue violet actually and cool that down quite a bit. So the violet, it's twofold. 
Yellow and purple are complements. So they're harmonious when they're put together. And also one is cool and one is warm. So we want the cool one to recede and the warm one to come forward. And just when you think you've got the warm, cool thing figured out, then you gotta figure, well, wait a minute, where's the dark light thing comes in here somewhere. And you gotta figure out where's the dark and where's the light. Okay, so this little part of the cloud, does it appear to come forward here compared to this? What do I need to do? So what do I need to do? I could cool it. I could lighten it. Remember, we've got the warm, cool thing going on, but we also have light, dark thing going on. Now, because there's not so much paint on this canvas yet, I can actually scooch this paint uh, one color, one value into another. How are we doing on time? We're good. Yeah, we're good. We got about 40 more minutes. Oh gosh, you poor people. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Yes. I always paint the darks first. However, when I paint plain air, and I'm not a good plain air painter, I dabble it. I just dabble with it. But um, I do underpaint. I paint wet into wet. So the first thing I do is cover the canvas with burnt sienna, almost always burnt sienna when I plain air. And then I'll take a, a small brush and I'll draw the, sh the basic shapes, the masses basically. And then I take a rag and I'll pull out the light. So I've got the darks in there, I've got the lights in there, everything else is middle value. But here's something really important about composition. The most important thing I could ever tell anyone about composition is that you wanna look at composition in three, three parts. Mostly, some, and little bit. What does that mean? That is so important. If you took all your dark color, your dark values and piled it all up into a little pile, and then you took all your middles and you piled it up into a little pile and all your lights and piled it up, you want those three piles to be uneven. One needs to be mostly, one needs to be some, and one needs to be little bit. That's the best composition that you can possibly think of. Well, no, you probably think of many more. Just don't say it while I'm up here. But if you, let's take this little one, for example. If you take all the darks and you put it into one pile, I'll hold it up. This painting is mostly dark, all right? But then if I take all my middle values, this, 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 and this, and this, there's some. That pile would be smaller than the pile that I have all the darks in. And then where's my tiny little bit? Right there, right there. And it's an automatic focal point when you do it this way. But that doesn't mean that every painting has to be mostly dark, some middle, and a little bit of light. It can be in any combination that you want. You'd be mostly middle some dark, a little bit of light, or a little bit of dark, et cetera, et cetera. 
as long as you have break it up those three ways, you're going to have a great composition. Mostly some, a little bit. I think just to change this up a little bit, I'm going to put some dye in. Now, sky is darker at the top and lighter at the bottom because the top is closer to outer space. And the bottom of the sky is closer to Earth. So it has bounced light. from the earth up. I'm just putting this value in here and this bright color, what's happening to this cloud value wise. It did, why is that? Just say, just say why. Who was that, Gary? Yes, why did it come warmer? That's right. That blue is really cool compared to that cloud. If I look at the cloud, it's got some purple in it. Purple has blue, but it also has red. So that's going to be warmer than that blue. And since I want that part of the cloud to come forward, didn't that work out nice? So while I'm doing this sky here, you can see I'm not trying to be really terribly perfect around these corners of the cloud because I'm going to be blending those edges anyway. Now, when I say blending the edges, I don't blend all of the edges. I'm gonna blend, here's another couple of terminology nuggets that you can use when you're painting to impress your friends. <laughs> so an object affected by light has an active side and an inactive side. Can you guess what the active side is? Where the light is. It's the side with most of the light. So in this case, since most of our light's at the top, this is gonna be my active side. Inactive is where the shape goes into shadow or, or where it, it um, not necessarily shadow, where it cools also. So if it's cooling down here, and that's my shadow area, this is my inactive side. So I want all of this little, I call it Twitter, stuff that happens along the edge of the active side to happen up on the top. Down on the bottom, I'm softer, I want it to go away from me. So I'm gonna do a smoother blending down there. I'm not gonna have a lot of contrast down there uh, because I don't, that's not the story. The story is the Twitter. It's the active side is the story. You think about it this way, look at a painting of a tree. So it's, it has some light leaves on it, generally speaking, let's say, a tree in the sun. Where are you going to look? You're going to look on the dark side of the tree where the shadow is. You're going to look at the light. Your eye is automatically drawn to that light. So how would I handle that? So clean brush, soft another filbert. If I wanted to add more detail, I actually think that's detailed enough. And I have a little bit of an, an outline of yellow. I actually kind of like that a little bit. But like I want to add a little bit of activity here, a little bit more Twitter.
Now, when you do this and you work into the background, unless you're wanting to pull some of that sky in there, just make a few brush marks and wipe your brush. Okay, don't clean it because if you clean it, you're gonna get Gamsol or Terp, whatever you use as your brush cleaner. And then that weakens the paint and it also coincidentally weakens your brush strokes. And here where you're acting, adding um, activity, you're gonna want your brush to be filled with a little bit more paint. So you can touch it and it sticks. All right, so let's see what we can do down here. So when you all paint, how many of you uh, paint from the top to the bottom without stopping? Anybody? Okay, so do you paint in one day? No. All right, but you'd like to you like to work that direction from top to bottom. I like working um, a little bit all over, but I would most definitely finish. Uh, I can't talk and paint. Sorry finish the sky before I finish the clouds because this clouds overlap the sky. So I wanna see in every aspect of this painting, I wanna see what overlaps what here. And if this is the inactive side of my cloud, I'm gonna want that to be softened. I can't soften it into something that's not wet. So I would need my sky down there. I don't use cerulean. I don't like cerulean very much. It has kind of a gray look. Yeah, that is. That is cobalt violet. And um, uh, turquoise. Yeah, turquoise and cobalt violet. Now, now there's a conundrum. You've got a warm and a cool mixed together. What is a warm? If you mix a warm and a cool together in equal parts, do you know what that does? It neutralizes, they neutralize each other. And you may want that. Uh, for the life of me, I couldn't think why, but you might want that. You know, for years and years, I told my students, never put the focal point in the middle of the canvas because it makes a bullseye and the viewer just looks right at that spot. Well, there's a wonderful artist who did exactly that. It was three portraits, I can't, he's teaching a workshop here. But um, he had, it was Day of the Dead, he had this portrait of this beautiful young woman and she's got this makeup on and then up above her was a mask on a pole and it was another head right on top of her head. Then down below was sort of a, a skeleton of uh, the head of some kind of a dinosaur thing. There were three portraits right in a row, her face, the focal point was right smack in the middle and it worked beautifully. I mean, it was incredible. Thank you, Patrick Saunders. That painting, look it up sometime. It is gorgeous. And he, he did such a fabulous job on that painting. Yeah, good memory. <laughs> so at any rate, um, oh, 
Okay, I'm going to get a little bit more paint on here and then I'm going to magic brush this. <laughs> I will tell you that they don't make magic brushes. That's just my name for a particular brush that I've used for years. They by the bell. There is a little bit of Prussian blue in this actual photograph, but I'm not going to be adding that. All right, let's get some sky around this. Now, ordinarily, I would lighten the sky a little bit. Oh my gosh, I have a cloud fetish. <laughs> I absolutely have, I have thousands of on my way here. I, I couldn't stop because we had to get here. Oh, look at that cloud. <laughs> but yeah, photo references, because I, I really basically I am a studio painter and I just fiddle with plain air. Although I'll tell you, I'll tell you a wonderful plain air story for me. <laughs> this was an OPA uh, national competition. It was in Utah, it was in Zion. I'd never been there before. I was just, I was overwhelmed with the beauty and the height and the size of everything. But um, I had wanted to paint a dry riverbed. And we looked everywhere. We looked for days trying to find a dry riverbed and we couldn't. So we decided to go on to Zion. And so we drove up there. And on the way, there's a dry riverbed right off the highway. So I hollered at Donna, stop! <laughs> and she pulled over and she said, why, what, what, what? And I jump out. And to get down to that riverbed, you had to slide down these rocks, embankment, under barbed wire. And then walk over these boulders to get down there. Yeah, I really wanted it bad. So I get down there, and there's a guy down there painting plain air. And it was um, Matt Smith. Thank you. Yeah, Matt Smith. It was fabulous. So he's painting, and I introduced myself and, and said, I've been looking for this place forever. And he said, yeah, he says, go ahead and take some photographs. He said, but don't stay too long because there are snakes. Oh, God. Mm. <laughs> and I didn't have on boots, <laughs> tennis shoes, you know. So anyway, I'm taking pictures. And I said, absolutely, I will not take a picture of your painting. So don't worry about that. So I didn't. I took the whole area. And so two years later, I decided to do a painting from those photographs. And I did this landscape and I have to say I think it was probably my best landscape ever I loved it loved it and I'm looking online there's M Matt Smith or Steve Stouffer it was Steve Stouffer yeah it was Steve Stouffer yeah okay anyway his painting of that exact spot was online my heart stopped I thought, oh my God, he's going to think I copied this art because I already entered it in a competition, you know? And so, gosh, I got, I wrote to him. I found his email and I wrote to him and he was so kind. He said, you know, you can't copyright an idea and it's a free country. You could paint the exact same spot. It's not a problem for me. And then uh, I, and I thanked him and I said, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with this painting. I just feel so bad about it. I mean, it was identical, the same spot, same bush, same rock. So uh, he wrote back and he said, well, just, I'm curious, can I, you know, could you send me a picture of your painting? So I did, and he wrote back and he said, 
Well, that beats the dog out of my painting. <laughs> and he says, he says, show it. Good luck with it, you know, which I thought was very generous. And um, and it's at Marietta Cobb Museum right now. So Wonderful. yeah, it th that's my best plain air story. Probably couldn't get any better. Yeah. But you did it from your reference. I wasn't plain air. He was plain air painting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did it for my photo reference. But see, if I had actually taken a picture of his painting, I would have known, don't paint this section, Nikki, move over two or three steps, you know, but I didn't. So that's how that happened. I did about the same thing one time on a trip to uh, Peru. We were pulled up in this village and there were these steps going up and I looked at that and I thought, and, you know, women were sitting on the steps weaving and all that. And I thought, oh, that would make a great painting. So I took photographs of it, came home and painted it. And on the cover of Watercolor Magic was the same thing. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Not, it was a good subject. <laughs> but I, mine was not going in a contest. Yeah, well, oh, once it's out there, you know, it's hard to put back in the bottle. Okay, I'm going to soften the bottom of this. Just use a magic brush here. See, I haven't paid much attention to there. Now, what's a magic brush? Magic brush is one that is soft enough to knock the edges off of your painting and to blend slightly. Not strong enough or stiff enough to actually blend a lot because you'll lose what you put on there. So there are different brushes that you can get. This is a Hobby Lobby's version of a magic brush and it's a good size. I've got five of these that I've had for 20 years, these. And they are the best brush ever. And they just make the nicest, softest looks. If that's what you need, if that's what you want for your painting, so the trick with it is if you push too hard and your paint is too wet, you'll lose it. But if you do it right, with just the right amount of pressure, it softens all your edges for you. If you put too much Gamsol or Terp on there, you will lose it. But my point here is to try to get rid of too much contrast down at the bottom of my cloud. And I'm probably just about done with this cloud because it's not something that I'm, you know, I'm not competing with this, but I wanted to show you how you might build the volume in your cloud. You see how soft that brush is? And it just really floats one color into another without really losing too much of what's of either one. Now, if I were going to finish this cloud, I'd probably put a little bit more emphasis. Down in this area, but not much. I don't want to see that so much.
So what I'm looking for is that I want to see that it's there, but I don't want it to slap me in the face. You know, I don't want it to be so strong that it would just smack me in the face because it's not about the bottom, it's about the top. How are we on time? We have uh, 17 minutes. Okay. How about questions? It's uh, kind of fair. Do you have any brushes? You got all hair brushes and some other softer hair brushes. Good question. Yes, yeah, good you, question. You painted in the start. Do you use hog hair brushes? None. I don't like hog's hair because to me, it's a waste of money for the way I paint. Hog's hair, if you scrub with it, you know how it becomes bristly. It looks like the back of a hog after a while. It gets real stiff. Sometimes at some point it even breaks off. So what I use for it, then that's what I call a bully brush that bullies the paint, pushes it around the canvas. Um, I use an angle brush, synthetic. And everything, I used to get just rosemary brushes. You know how expensive those things are. And I found that Hobby Lobby's brand synthetics last way longer. They do the, a great job. I love them. Um, I love all of their um, uh, filberts. And detail brushes never last anyway. You know, you get that little teeny, tiny, skinny thing. Uh, so, that's gonna last like two paintings, three paintings, and then pretty soon the hair goes like that. And you can never get it to do that again. <laughs> so I just throw those away. I buy the cheap ones and throw those away. But, you know, typically in a painting, if like for instance, that one or that one, good size, I probably use 10, 15 brushes at least on that painting. And I do it all at once, it's all, a la prima. So I don't like using Gamsol to clean my brush in the middle of a painting because it weakens the paint, it weakens your brush stroke. Um, so I have, I've got like a bazillion of these. So how do you clean it after you get home? Right? Okay, so good question also. Um, there are a couple of products that I've tried out uh, where you don't really have to clean the brush, you just dip it, it's called brush dip, and you dip the brush in there, paint and all, and, uh, and let it set on this little rocker arm. That way, the next day, you can wipe it with a rag and get right back in and start painting. It never dries. But I found after a while, it kind of gun gunks up in the ferrule of your brush. I'm not using that anymore. So at the end of the day, I wipe everything off that I can with paper towel, then I use Gamsol and I clean it. And I do this because I paint every day. I do this every day. And then at the end of the week, I give them a good bath. So I'll use, uh, I think it's called Old Rush. It is, um, it's a cake soap for cleaning oil painting, uh, uh, oil paint brushes. And I love that it conditions them. And then once I've cleaned them, you have to like really clean them like two or three times at a setting to get them really clean and then push them back into shape. Make sure all the moisture, the water's dried off of that. And look, I mean, I've been painting with this brush forever and it's still as good today as it was the day that I bought it. And I really scrub with this. I mean, this is what I paint all my backgrounds with. Here's a big one. Uh, but, but mostly what I use to paint with um, are filberts of all different sizes, but synthetic. Um, now, there are specialty brushes that I've used that I've sort of made myself, paint grass, like the, the, uh, the moss, uh, not moss, but the, um, the marsh, the grass in the marsh. That's just a cheap brush from Home Depot that I took scissors to and clipped it all around it, you know, so that it's not, not all the bristles are the same length. They're up and down and in and out. And then you just lay that paint or that brush on that paint and just touch it to your canvas and it leaves the mark of grass. 
So I just call it grass brush. So it's two bucks for that one. Um, let's see, other specialty brushes. I do, uh, I get a lot of portrait commissions and very often I'll get someone with a plaid shirt and they want that plaid shirt. Ooh. <laughs> but I found a great tool for that. So for instance, they're wearing a plaid shirt. Paint the shirt as if it didn't have any stripes on it at all or any plaid on it at all, but paint the lights, the darks, the wrinkles, everything. Let it dry. And now there's this brush that you can buy that it's, it's a square, but it's got a hole cut out here and a hole cut out here and a hole cut out here. So it's like a time, you know, like four times on a brush. You dip that in, in paint that's been thinned down with thinner and you follow it along every wrinkle all the way down from the top to the bottom of the shirt and it makes it plaid. Pretty amazing, actually. I kind of shocked myself, but um, and now I don't fear doing plaid anymore because it's it's something that's possible. And at the bottom of a painting, I try to wipe everything out on portraits. Just wipe it out, let it disappear, so that plaid just sort of disappears into the rest of the composition. Plaid's a hard thing to paint. That and tea. Yeah, I don't know why mamas and daddies want their babies painted with all those tea or some of those teeth, because sometimes they're missing. Sometimes they have braces. Sometimes they have braces and missing teeth. I mean, uh, I, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Can you talk just a little bit more about when you're, when you're talking about the size and the different compositions? Do you have like a map tool for how much time they're gonna put in? Do you have like a just let the clouds kind of talk to you, or how do you really go ahead and start? Where am I going to put my horizon? Yes. And yes, and yes. yes. <laughs> All those things happen. So you have to ask yourself in the very beginning when you get your references together, or if you're outside painting, you have to decide what is the story? Is it the landscape, or is it the cloud? Is it the cactus? Is it the figure? that should take precedence. So when I decided, for instance, to do this, when you can see that with these two canvases next to each other, proportionately, there's more land here than there is here. I did want this to be most important, but I didn't want it to be overwhelming. And a lot of times these little teeny tiny clouds you just get, gosh, you know, it's, it's too much, like lace. You know, it's just way too much stuff going on. And I do have a problem with when to stop. And I have always had that problem because, you know, more is better, right? More is more. <laughs> but at any rate, um, in this particular case, I wanted to have enough land that would balance out the size of the cloud, not so much the value because these values are pretty much the same value. It's just that this is warmer and this is cooler. So that gives me a separation. But in this case, I wanted to have a little bit more of land to balance this huge cloud, because that's a really huge cloud. Everybody see Texas? <laughs> <laughs> the title of this is Deep in the Heart. And uh, when, I, when I took the photo of this, that shape was in there. It wasn't as perfect a shape of Texas, but I made it more perfect, perfecter. And so I looked up the heart of Texas and there's a town in, in Texas called Brady and they consider themselves the heart of Texas. And they're not exactly in the middle exactly of, of Texas, but they're the closest town to the middle of Texas. So they call themselves the heart of Texas. And so, I'm actually going to send them this picture. See, maybe the mayor wants to buy it. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Anyway, I love the light in it. And, and then in this one, I mean, this really was very extraordinary. But you notice uh, the light. The light was so extraordinary this day. But you notice how dark the top is? So I could actually have that darker top and still have this bright in here and it doesn't require so much land. In fact, I think it would be detrimental 
to bring that gland up a little bit higher. You'd lose the height, the depth of that sky in there. Did that, does that help you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, 10 paintings. How many of those 10 ever see the, the light of day? How many? How many That's you interesting. Have? What, what percent of your paintings go into frames and go into galleries and go to people? Do you ever make mistakes? <laughs> tonight? <laughs> you mean tonight or yesterday? <laughs> um, yeah, I do make mistakes. I probably, in my studio, I know I've got hundreds of paintings in my studio, hundreds. Uh, some are started, some will go somewhere, some are getting ready to get started. But of the ones that I'm not going to finish, I probably have a good 70, maybe 80 that I'll never go back to because of that. You know, I get all excited in the beginning. And then the process of painting, I've lost the spontaneity. That's the problem with not painting from life. You can lose spontaneity really quick. If you're looking at this photograph, photographs lie, you can easily lose your, uh, your excitement about this particular composition. But I do have two galleries that I show in, one's in Tulsa, and I sell a lot of work out of that, out of that studio. So yeah, I feed them all the time. Do you reuse? Do you need to, I'm sorry. Do you reuse your canvases? No, rarely. Just because you just. Well, it's going to be bumpy and it's going to be slick in spots. And oh, that's another thing. Varnish. Anybody have problems with varnish? 